in, in looking at, I'd like to begin this morning with Tom Daly. Tom, where are you, Tom? <laughs> Tom comes from uh, Lexington, I believe. Tom comes from Lexington, and he is a well-known, respected poet of the Boston area. He grew up in Connecticut, Virginia, and North Carolina, and said that he spent his childhoods in Gloucester at the beach, uh, having fun with his cousins, both inside uh, the attic, uh, telling stories, as well as outside on the beach, looking at the stars. His first exposure to poetry and interest in it came from his mother sharing the golden treasury of poetry book with him. And uh, he was uh, intrigued uh, by uh, the world of poetry and noted that the first poem which brought him to the power of poetry that it can have on people was about a group of soldiers who were gassed in World War I. His, he went on to write his own poetry and it has been published in many places, including Fence, Harvard Review, Prairie Schooner, Poetry of Ireland Review, and a number of others. He's had a manuscript as a finalist for the Poetry Foundation's Emily Dickinson First Book Contest, a recipient of the Charles and Fanny Fay Wood Prize from the Academy of American Poets. He's the author of a play, Every Broom and Bridget, of Emily Dickinson and Her Servants, which he performs as a one-man show. He's teaching a course on Emily Dickinson in January. He leads many workshops in poetry and memoir writing in Boston and Concord area. And Tom noted uh, also in his bio, um, when asked for a favorite moment sharing one of his poems, he said, a few years ago, a friend announced to an audience that had gathered to hear him at Forest Hills Chapel that I had been called away because of a personal emergency, but my mother had agreed to read in my stead. I arrived in drag, and after performing some poems in the voice of my mother as my mother, a woman in the audience who didn't know me turned to a friend of mine and asked, is that really his mother? <laughs> So I was wondering what Tom might be wearing this morning. <laughs> but I do know that his words will help to take us to another plane of awareness in existence. I look very much to hearing from him. Please give a warm morning welcome to Tom Daly. Your rallies were shod by banana peel blacksmiths. Yours is a republic of crash and crying out loud. Now you have nothing to lead us, just a darker tint to the windows of your limousine as you skitter off on another drive-by crisis. What do you mean by subterranean economies? If these dips are mavericks, why then are they little calves bleating for their brands? <gasps> I am wise to your feints, to your doping indicators, to your tribe of Tyro soothsayers who cut their teeth on their own sound bites. Sir, I am proud of my prudent weather. I never forswore my sweeteners completely, yet I know how to stretch the dregs in a bottle of ketchup. I canceled the milkman long before you cashed in your Krugerrands. <sighs> But, sir, this is slapdash. This is kidnapping. This is all my collectibles, cheek to cheek with the ukuleles in the pawn shop window. This is a dead letter destination for a mail order bride. These are the decades of tinned pilchards against which you said you had me inoculated. <laughs> Boy, you're a relief pitcher brokering a bases loaded with ball after ball after ball. You're a bank teller whose foot just happened to forget where the stick-up alarm floor pedal roosts on its springs in a week of serial robberies just like this one. The next poem is... Okay, thank you for the applause. For the rest of the set, just to save time, because I got a close, close set going, and to save the, your carpal tunnels, um, 
If you would just hold off on the applause, if you have any, you can save it for the end, okay? <laughs> My mother speaks with two police officers who visit her home on Good Friday afternoon. This is a little different tone here. What was his poison? Short days getting longer. They were only old taunts, but they soaped all his mirrors. Gentlemen, come see our piano. It's black keys all stooped by the weight of his knuckles. Here's a hope chest that sealed the rot in his slapstick, hoarded the stains where his t-shirt sweated out Trotskyist proverbs. Here's a vat for his vinegar, a cruet for his chrism. See that sticky fly trap? It dangles his tear salts with the smut from his incense. The holes in his sock drawer stung the hands of their darner. You speak of a building roof, of a leap so exotic, so unlike how he drowned our garage in distemper. Was it the last of his cigarettes he slammed for the heartbreak? Blown kiss for the boys he had chased into whiplash? Was it windburn and brownout as he spilled through the downdrafts? Did he shake off his skin or tear it to toothache? Did my boy flatten his crown or land on his hands? In the midst of all that gravel, split his shins into charms. My mother remembers my father 20 years after their divorce. Dear traitor, when you tripped from sleep, did dreams of me encumber you? That day we drove all night to find cold white caps shuffling into view. Stung sand that drained the wind from grace. Short clouds that stamped and surged against a bay that had abandoned blue. In place of sun, a petrol gray. In place of love, this new lament. In place of time, our old dismay. So loved, you could not know the why, nor understand the strange complaint I lodged against the lowering sky that woke you up to this restraint. After a stroke, my mother addresses an image of the icon of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Lady, why is your countenance the color of wool feet draggling from the jaws of a cat? What tribe of mud daubers stung stars unto your mantle? Who names the fumbles that topple from your breasts? Your counterspell blunts the jagged crescent of every campesino's smoldering scythe. Your spooled mouth waits to unfurl the ticker tape of your vow. In torchlight, your thin eyebrows fly to heaven on wings of soot. Only the moon survives the crush of your heel. Virgin of Guadalupe, I pray for your handshakes. I pray for your ribs. I pray for your hips, the ones wrenched dry, expelling that bountiful head, ordained to gnaw all the hangnails of history. Steer me, lady, through the lightning that browns the mountains. Drown the infections that flush my cough into a gargle. Virgin, who never burnt a supper, strip me of strangles, of jazz, of scratched sleep skipping the shadows out of my world. Princess of the Aztecs, 
Would you thread my poncho with roses this winter, that I might deck that tomb slab where even cayenne would cool, where your son's brain was leached of its chemical salves, and where his feet, which once stretched to the sea flat as a conga head, refused to rest at right angles to the ground. Kiss me, mother of Mexico's hope. Your little mouth is still rusty with smoke. After a stroke, my mother addresses a photograph of children lying on a sidewalk in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. The sign behind you reads, Ecole Primaire. But if this is a primary school, why are you children napping on the sidewalk? Your sheets yanked over your heads, your ankles dangling over the curb. Someone has powdered your legs. Someone has set you on your backs to strain all morning towards the pester in the shadow behind the January sky. Children of the Ecole Primaire, when we stricken finally stand and cross over to the mouth of the shadow, this is what we must say. It is honorable to be stunned and then revealed. Nothing is mistaken, but many things are undermined. To heal, to heal is to betray the grace that kindled this and every cataclysm. Peace, peace, children. If your last flinch has thickened the frown of the messenger puppet, nailed to the last tree, tilting against the last of the cemetery wall, remember, remember, you were all felled by a concussion louder and more terrible than the trapdoor of the thuggish Tonton Makut. The white dust that stifled your breath whiffled itself out of the hoofprints of an impatient apocalypse. If we could see your faces, they would be one spider scratch of simper and wrench, one witness vouching that under the crust of the land, everything is falling, falling in fluid fire, one testament that the clumsy arbitrage of an empire is a colony that shambles whenever the earth slips. Oh, patience, patience, children. Forever will always conjure something sweeter than the back alley odor of magic. Patience, they are coming for us soon enough. The dump truck to lug us to the masked soldier, the masked soldier to roll us in white lime, the white lime to peel our skin like paper off tin. If the tiny bones of our ears spin like jacks in the aftershocks. The coming cold rain will stir every indignity from our ashes. The cold rain will clear our copybook ciphers and letters, which are hoarded, which are scrawled in ink, hoarded from dust, gathered in the shadows of hell. My mother speaks to me on the morning of her cremation. When you remember me, remember my eyes as they were when you lifted the lid of the cardboard box for one last look. Remember they were open, no coins to weight them shut, gray blue fixed on the ceiling taking in nothing, beautiful in their purposelessness. In the future, I will come back to you in glimpses, pieces of me looking around your corners, fond and animated. But for now, my eyes are resolute, unperturbed, beyond stasis, ready for the fire. In that place, where both healing and damage are mutually suppressed, 
where ambition and frustration have steamed away between the tiny ridges of a sandbar, leaving a little salt, a little grit. So I would be averse if I wrote, read a whole bunch of poems about my mother and didn't say anything about my father. Cheryl mentioned that I spent uh, summer vacations at a beach in Gloucester. The beach was Wingersheek Beach. Some of you may know it. Beautiful beach in West Gloucester. And this is a poem that I wrote for my father as he was dying of prostate cancer. This is a, uh, a broadside with old uh, antique photographs of Gloucester and Wingersheek, which is available afterwards. The poem is called Rocket Inn for my father. Body surfing off the beach at West Gloucester, our feet found your shoulders underwater. Our hands grabbed your hands, and we climbed your back as if it were a missile pad, your hair matted down as you crouched in the teeth of high tide. You tossed us out to sea a hundred miles, but the ripples we made came back as bunching swells that bent and teased the air, so that far off you could see them fatten, a landscape of rows of molehills shuddering over the sandbars. Minus your morphine drip and your catheter, and with your freckled head itching with foam, we remember you here in this place. Imagine you, clam noises, and the smell of the wind whirring through screens, the sun blinking phosphorescence over your head. We sidle up to you as you stand in the sand yard. Your eyes are careful. They squint at the sun. You're wearing a red plaid jacket. Your hair slicked back with hair cream or the salt of an early morning dip. You must be on your way to mass to eat the cardboard tasting wafer you believe is divine, Irish divine, Irish Catholic in West Gloucester. Now you are brawling with your sister in the back seat. Now your father is barking at the potholes in the roller coaster road. You might slip from the car with us and come with us and kick our way out to the longest, farthest sandbar. Mount Agamenticus looming like a skellig in the distance. The Isles of Shoals, a Greek freighter in the blue haze. The lighthouse beams angle your skin up and up into the sky, a hundred miles. Your skin and your freckles are like stars in the bay foam now. Phosphorescence blinking on the horizon. Stirred up by storms and the warm love you rocket us in on some body surfing winger chic day. My last piece is a, a soliloquy from the poem that Cheryl mentioned. It's in the voice of Tom Kelly, who was an Irish immigrant who was an employee of the Dickinsons, who were a wealthy Yankee family. And uh, Emily Dickinson and Tom Kelly had a kind of platonic relationship. He, she appointed him to be her chief Irish pallbearer, her chief pallbearer, which was sort of the equivalent of some very wealthy woman in Lincoln or Weston having her um, Laosh and sand, floor sanding crew would be her pallbearer. She wanted an Irish. And this was, this was her way of sort of thumbing her nose at proper Yankee society who considered the Irish to be uh, second class citizens. Um, so the play is in the voice of Tom Kelly who sort of channels the events of the day of Emily Dickinson's death. And um, in this soliloquy, he's standing outside of uh, Emily Dickinson's window. I, I've, I've printed out the soliloquy on another broadside, which is also available. Um, so imagine Tom Kelly, chief Irish Paul Bear, standing outside Emily Dickinson's window the night after her funeral. The poet, Emily Dickinson. There'll be no lamplight burning your window panes this evening. There'll be nothing burning for me ever again in this place. How many times have I run here for my rounds as watchman for the college to keep a secret vigil here under your window as the shadow of your pen 
feathered its mysterious codes out to the Milky Way. Just around the corner is your garden, where we committed our first confidences. Spring mornings, I'd bring you a load of manure. In the fall, I'd put your beds to sleep. That's where we had our short laughs about the long lunacies of women and men. And that's where you told me of your squelched yearning and how that other side sometimes pierced you clear through like the tines of a pitchfork. And that's where I told you of my terrible feeling that I was nothing more than a tenant in the garret of my own heart. Ah, there was never a woman to talk to you, talk to like you, Miss M. Not my wife Mary, not her sister Maggie, your housekeeper, worrying themselves over children sick or in good health, or constantly negotiating someone else's housekeeping out of deadlock. And you had your own distractions too, after all. You were the refined, if enigmatic, daughter of a Protestant squire. A woman who could only be discreetly and occasionally aware of the fervent attention of this Catholic serf. Oh, I think of you now as a votive bat blinking out of small caves. A, a prehistoric bird, a, a cormorant skimming through water tension, and then flinging yourself into air darker than the bone of time. You were a marsh, drowned in the thaws of April, a torch fusing pollen and horsehair. The wags in town and the imbecile critics dubbed you the half-cracked poetess of Amherst. But I'm guessing, only guessing, Miss M, that someday your words will shiver the world with their sleet. Ah, oh, Miss Emily, I'd ask God to grant you eternal rest, but somehow I know your unquiet soul will be having none of it. I remember once over here, and you say, at school there was a clock and a regiment of girls gripping their hymnals and standing at stiff and compliant attention. I'll wager my right arm that you turned on the sour heel of your theology and stared them all down. That's my girl. Lord, if the apostate Emily Dickinson has refused your grant of peace everlasting, may perpetual light shine upon her. Oh, I hope you don't mind me saying this, Lord, but the woman was like like a trinity to me. Whale oil, lampwick, and above all, flame. I curse my fate that I lived long enough to see you snuff it all away. Thank you very much. Thank you. All those. Do you know why the angels envy us? Us who have to eat and defecate and die? Why wrath and grace keep descending upon us? Us who can't even remember where we left our car keys in the morning? It begins with music, the root of commonality for the whales and wolves and songbirds, as much as for those early humans who learned to drum before they learned to speak, who never would have painted those bison on the wall if they had not first heard their own voices singing in the sacred darkness. We carry rhythm within us, in the rise and fall of the breath, in the pulsing of the blood, even in the pain of losing. Give it up, take it in, let it go again. And in the melody of this movement, there's a heavy weight of joy rising, easy enough to forget about, to bury under a lifetime of complacency, but still necessary, still available to the real arising. Holy moments, like fireflies flashing in the dark of a summer night. Deeper revelations, like whippoorwills calling again and again in the last hour before dawn. 
If we were to, to swim in joy like an ocean, be overwhelmed by it, held up by it on every side, would we learn to hear our music echo back to us as knowledge? Would we grow fins and learn to suckle our young while floating? Would we learn to hold these moments between being and becoming, between the, the honeyed deep or the empty blue? But anyone who has thought, be they monkey or dolphin, human or celestial, already knows the answer. And that is not the reason for the envy of the angels. Because music may be the engine of creation, but the word singing free is. And when the two come together, breath and presence, balancing moment, uniquely perfect beauty, rising and falling, falling and forming like snow crystals in the dark of a winter night, when the miracle incarnates, we rise hands and feet, eyes and tongue, singing the word free, singing free the word. Thank you. Peach and pear.